Hello and welcome. My name is Matthew Wright. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications at the University of Minnesota. Today I'll be speaking about intrinsic volumes of random cubicle complexes. This presentation is similar to a seminar I gave at the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications on April 1st, 2014. And this work is in collaboration with Michael Werman of Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I'd like to begin with a discussion of the motivation for this work. This work is motivated by the following question. How can we understand the size of noise in digital images? Suppose I have a digital image and I just select some of the pixels randomly. I consider this a model for random noise. How can I understand the size of this noisy set? To understand size, I'd like to introduce the concepts of valuation and intrinsic volumes. A valuation is a notion of size. Suppose I have a collection S of subsets of d-dimensional Euclidean space. A valuation on S is a function V that assigns a real number to each set, such that the empty set gets assigned the number 0, and the valuation of the union of two sets A and B is equal to the valuation of A plus the valuation of B minus the valuation of the intersection of A and B. This is called the additive property, or the inclusion-exclusion principle. This means that if I know the valuation of a set A, and I know the valuation of a set B, and I also know the valuation of the intersection of A and B, then I automatically know the valuation of the union of A and B. And this is a very important property of evaluation. The intrinsic volumes are examples of valuations that generalize both volume and the Euler characteristic. For sets in d-dimensional space, there are d plus 1 intrinsic volumes, which are denoted mu0 up to mu d. These are continuous Euclidean invariant valuations. What does that mean? Well, continuous in this case means that if you take a set in Rd and you modify it a little bit, the intrinsic volumes don't change very much. And Euclidean invariant means that if you take a set and apply a rigid motion to it, if you translate it or rotate it, the intrinsic volumes don't change at all. Let me provide a little bit of intuition about what these particular intrinsic volumes measure. In general, mu k gives a k-dimensional notion of the size of a set. This is natural if we start at the, at the top dimensional intrinsic volume, mu d is simply the d-dimensional volume of a set. On the lower end, mu 0 is always the Euler characteristic of a set. mu d minus 1 is related to the, the d minus 1 dimensional surface area, and in fact it's half the surface area of the set. Why half? Well, that has to do with the fact that the intrinsic volumes are normalized to be intrinsic to sets and do not depend on the ambient space in which a set might be embedded. That's why there's a factor of a half showing up in mu d minus 1. Mu 1 is related to the width of a set. It's sort of the mean width, length, if you will, of a set. And in general, like I said, mu k gives a k-dimensional notion of the size of a set. In fact, the classical Hadwiger theorem says that any Euclidean invariant valuation continuous on compact convex sets is a linear combination of the intrinsic volumes. Therefore, if you understand the intrinsic volumes, in some ways you understand all possible notions of size suitably defined. The intrinsic volumes are often defined via a tube formula. Let me explain. Suppose I have x, a compact and convex set in the plane, and suppose I draw a tube around it. The tube is simply all of the points in the plane whose distance from the set is less than or equal to some radius r. And I'd like to know, what is the area of this tube around my set x? Well, how might I think about that? Well, the area of the tube, because the tube is a two-dimensional set, I can say the area is equal to intrinsic volume mu2 of the tube. This certainly contains the area of x. The area of x is part of the area of the tube. What's left? Well, I can draw these green regions around each of the sides of my set x. Those are also contained inside the tube. What is their area? Well, the area of this green region 
is equal to the perimeter of x times the radius r. And I can write the perimeter in this rather funny way. It's twice mu1 of x, because mu1 is half the perimeter of x. What's left in my tube? Well, the regions that are left are these purple regions, which happen to form exactly a circle of radius r. I can write the area of this circle as follows. It's well, it's really pi r squared, but I can write it as pi times mu zero of x times r squared, because mu zero of x is really the Euler characteristic of my set x. And this completes the formula for the area of the tube. Now why did I write it this way? I wrote it this way to emphasize that the area of the tube is really a polynomial in the radius r whose coefficients involve the intrinsic volumes of the original set x. This is an important principle. In general, if I have a d-dimensional compact convex set x, the d-dimensional volume of the tube around the set x is a polynomial in R whose coefficients involve the intrinsic volumes of x. And this is called the Steiner formula. It's related to the Weyl tube formula as well. Here's the formula. The volume of the tube is given like this, and you see not only the intrinsic volumes appearing, but also omega sub d minus k. This is just the, the volume of the unit d minus k ball. And there's the intrinsic volume. So this formula is often used as a definition of the intrinsic volumes, at least for compact convex sets. Today, however, we're primarily concerned about cubes. And it turns out the intrinsic volumes on cubes are, are actually quite simple. Suppose I have a, a d-dimensional closed box, maybe not necessarily a cube, but a rectangular prism with side lengths x1 up through xd. The intrinsic volume, mu k of x, and again, this gives a notion of the k-dimensional size of x, is equal to the elementary symmetric polynomial of degree k on d variables. So suppose I have this box here, mu zero of x, this is the degree zero elementary symmetric polynomial on d variables, which is always just one. And that should make sense because mu zero for a compact convex set is the Euler characteristic, which is always one. Mu one is the degree one elementary symmetric polynomial, which is simply the sum of the side lengths of the box. And again, this gives a notion of the length of the box. Mu two, the elementary symmetric polynomial of degree two, consists of products of all pairs of the side lengths. This gives a notion of the area of the box, and so on, all the way up to mu d, which is simply the product of the side lengths, which is again the d-dimensional volume of the box. All of this is especially nice if the box has unit side lengths, in which case we have a d-dimensional unit cube and the intrinsic volume mu k of this cube is simply the binomial coefficient d choose k. So we could even take this as the definition for intrinsic volumes of cubes, but I wanted to provide some of the more general theory because the intrinsic volumes are usually defined in terms of a tube formula and this is a consequence. What if we instead consider an open cube? And by that I mean a cube x without its boundary. The intrinsic volumes of an open cube can be obtained from the intrinsic volume of closed cubes and the additive property. Let's see how this works. By additivity, the intrinsic volume mu k of a closed cube on the left is equal to the intrinsic volume of the open cube plus the intrinsic volume of its boundary. That's because of the open cube and the boundary are disjoint sets and their union is the closed cube. I can rearrange this expression to put the intrinsic volume of the open cube on the left. It's the intrinsic volume of the closed cube minus the intrinsic volume of its boundary. And then I can use additivity again to break up the boundary into intrinsic volumes of lower dimensional cubes. In this case, for example, for a two-dimensional cube, the boundary is a square, which can be decomposed into four closed edges, 
minus four vertices. A vertex, by the way, is a, is a closed zero-dimensional cube. So this is the decomposition of the boundary in the case where the dimension d is two. But in general, I can apply this same idea for any d-dimensional open unit cube. I find that if x is a d-dimensional open unit cube, then mu k of x can be written as the following sum, where here I have d choose j times two to the d minus j. This is just the number of j-dimensional faces of a d-dimensional cube, and j choose k is the intrinsic volume mu k of the closed unit j-dimensional cube. I can simplify this expression further. I can rearrange to combine the numbers that are raised to the d minus j power. And then I see two binomial coefficients. I can apply the following binomial coefficient identity. d choose j times j choose k is equal to d choose k times d minus k choose d minus j. Really, the principle is that if I have d items, and I first choose j, and then choose k, the number of ways of, of doing so are the same as first choosing k, and then choosing d minus j from the remainder. I can factor the, the coefficient d choose k out of the sum, and apply the binomial theorem, and I find that the intrinsic volume mu k of my open unit d-dimensional cube is simply minus 1 to the d minus k times the binomial coefficient d choose k. So really this is just plus or minus the intrinsic volume of the closed cube. And here I state that more concisely. If x is an open d-dimensional unit cube, then mu k of x is simply minus 1 to the d minus k times d choose k. So now we have the intrinsic volumes of open and closed unit cubes, and we can proceed to look at random cubical complexes. All right, well, what is a random cubical complex? Here's the scenario. Let's start with an n by n by n, d dimensions, grid of unit d cubes. So I have n cubes in each direction. I'm going to identify opposite faces of this grid. So I'm going to identify the, the faces that are highlighted in red and also the faces that are highlighted in blue so that this space I'm working in has the topology of a torus, a d-dimensional torus. This is just so that I can ignore the boundary effects and all of the, of the unit cubes in the grid have the same number of neighbors. Then I'm going to select cubes from the grid independently with probability p. So let's just look at p equals one half. I'm going to flip a coin, say, a fair coin, for each of the unit uh, two cubes, squares, in my grid. And if I get a, a one, then I'll color the, the, the square black, and that square is selected to be part of the random cubical complex. So the, the union of all of these cubes is the random cubical complex. It is a closed subset of the d-dimensional torus in which I am working. Now, it will be important for the rest of this talk to view a cubical complex as a disjoint union of open cubes. That'll make it easy to compute the intrinsic volumes. Why is this? Because of additivity. The additive property says that the intrinsic volume of a union of A and B is equal to the intrinsic volume of A plus the intrinsic volume of B minus the intrinsic volume of the intersection. But if A and B don't intersect, if I have a disjoint union, then the intersection term goes away, and I can very easily compute the intrinsic volume of the union once I have the intrinsic volumes of A and B. Let's see this in the context of a cubical complex. So let capital C be a cubical complex. In general, in this talk, capital C will be my cubical complex. Suppose I have the cubical complex that's pictured here, it consists of a union of these squares. And all of these squares, by the way, are closed sets. I can sort of explode this cubical complex to view it as a disjoint union of open cubes. You see I have some, some open two-dimensional cubes. The edge of each open two-dimensional cube is an open one-dimensional cube. And then I have a, an open zero-dimensional cube, which sort of by convention is a point at each vertex. So this is how I can view a cubical complex 
as a union of open cubes. Then it's very easy to find the intrinsic volume mu k of this entire complex because I know the intrinsic volumes of open unit cubes of all dimensions. I just have to count the number of open cubes of each dimension and add the intrinsic volumes up. I can write the intrinsic volume of this cubical complex as a sum over all the open cubes of the intrinsic volume of each open cube. And this will be a productive strategy for what is coming next. I next want to answer the question, how many open i cubes are in the grid for any integer i between 0 and d, the dimension of the grid? Well, here's how I can count these cubes. Let's assign a reference vertex for each cube, such that each vertex is the reference for the same number of i cubes. For example, if I'm working in the two-dimensional grid, I might choose the lower left vertex of each two-dimensional cube. And this will be the reference vertex not only for that two-dimensional cube, but also for two of the edges of this cube, the edges that I just highlighted in orange. So each vertex is the reference for one two-dimensional cube and two one-dimensional cubes that are edges of the two-cube. And you can see that all the cubes are included. Every cube is assigned a reference vertex. There are n to the d vertices in the grid, and there are d choose i, i cubes per reference vertex. Here we have each vertex is the reference for itself, a zero cube, for two one-dimensional cubes and one two-dimensional cube. Therefore, the number of i cubes in the grid is the number of vertices times the number of i cubes per vertex, n to the d times d choose i. Secondly, I'd like to answer the question, what is the probability of including any given open i cube in the cubical complex? Well, let's see. Let's let x be an open i cube, for example, this open one cube in my two-dimensional grid. X is a face of 2 to the d minus i d cubes. In my example here, X is a face of 2 two-dimensional cubes. And X is included in the cubical complex if any of these d-dimensional cubes are included. Equivalently, X is not included in the cubical complex if all of these d-dimensional cubes are not included. Let's recall that P is the probability of including any d-dimensional cube, let q equal 1 minus p, then the probability that x is not included in the cubical complex is q to the 2 to the d minus i. That's because there are 2 to the d minus i two-dimensional cubes whose inclusion causes x to be included. The probability that all of these two-dimensional cubes are not included is q to the 2 to the d minus i. Therefore, the probability that x is included is 1 minus q to the 2 to the d minus i. And this will also be an important quantity for what comes next. We are almost ready to find the expected values of the intrinsic volumes of a random cubical complex. But first, let's define some random variables. Let x be an open unit i cube possibly included in a random cubical complex c. For this x, define the indicator random variable xc sub x to be the intrinsic volume mu k of x if x is included in c and zero otherwise. Well, we know the value of mu k of x. It's minus one to the i minus k times the binomial coefficient i choose k. And we also now know the probability that x is included in the cubical complex c. That probability is one minus q to the 2 to the d minus i, where again, q is 1 minus p. q is the probability that each top dimensional cube is not included in the cubical complex. We can find the expected value of xc sub x. This is just the non-zero value that it takes times the probability that it takes that value. And then we can sum over all open unit cubes of all dimensions. The expected value, therefore, of mu k of the cubical complex is the sum over all open cubes of all dimensions of the expected value of xc sub x, which is as follows. We have a sum as i goes from k to d. That's the sum over all dimensions of the cubes that contribute to the intrinsic volume mu k. 
And for each i, we have d choose i times n to the d, that's the number of unit i cubes in our grid, times the expected value of xc sub x for each open i cube x. That's the expected value of the intrinsic volume mu k of a random cubical complex. One thing we notice here is that the variable n, the side length of our initial grid, only appears as a factor of n to the d. So we could factor it out and obtain a formula for the expected value of the intrinsic volumes per unit volume of our cubical complex. So we do that and we obtain the following theorem. The expected value of mu k of c per unit volume is a polynomial in q of degree 2 to the d minus k given by the following formula. This formula is equivalent to that which was displayed on the previous slide, just rewritten in a slightly more convenient way. Let's take a look at the expected value polynomials for small d and k. So here is a chart of the polynomials for small d and k. And what I notice is certain patterns along diagonals in this table. Let's look at this diagonal, which is highlighted, where d equals k. I see that the, the polynomial is simply 1 minus q. That's the probability p of including any top dimensional cube. Along the next diagonal, where d is 1 more than k, I see that all of the polynomials include a factor of q minus q squared. Along the next diagonal, I see all the polynomials are multiples of, of minus q plus 2q squared minus q to the fourth, and so on. These patterns along the diagonals continue. We can prove that they do throughout this, this entire table. And that we obtain the following proposition. If we let e sub d comma k of q be the expected value polynomial for mu k of c in dimension d, then these polynomials satisfy the following relationship, where the polynomial e sub d comma k is simply a multiple of the polynomial e sub d minus k comma zero. That is, the polynomials that give the expected intrinsic volumes are really multiples the polynomials that give the expected Euler characteristic. So if we call this value d minus k the co-dimension of the intrinsic volume mu k in R d, we see that the expected values of the intrinsic volumes are multiples of each other in the same co-dimension. Here in the table, we see that the intrinsic volumes for co-dimension 0 all have the expected value polynomial 1 minus q. For co-dimension 1, the expected value polynomials are multiples of q minus q squared, and so on. And in particular, the zeros of these polynomials depend only on the codimension. Thus, if we understand the polynomials that give the expected Euler characteristic, shown in the k equals zero row of the table, then we understand all of the expected intrinsic volumes. You might note that the polynomials that give the expected Euler characteristic almost look familiar, their coefficients are none other than the binomial coefficients. However, they're not quite the polynomials that result from binomial expansion, because the only powers of q that appear are powers of 2. Let's take a look at a picture. So here is a graph of some of the expected Euler characteristic polynomials. This polynomial here, E1, this is the expected Euler characteristic for a one-dimensional random cubical complex, that is, with cubes that are just unit segments on a line. If I look at the expected Euler characteristic polynomial for two-dimensional cubical complex, here it is, E sub 2, and then I can look at the expected Euler characteristic polynomial for cubes in a three-dimensional complex, and so on. For, here's for a four-dimensional complex. One thing I notice is that as I increase the dimension, the zeros of each polynomial interleave the zeros of the previous polynomial. For example, the purple polynomial, E1, only has zeros at its endpoints, 0 and 1. But the green polynomial, E2, has one zero in between 0 and 1. In between each pair of zeros of the green polynomial, the red polynomial has a zero, and so on. In between each pair of zeros of the red polynomial, E3, the orange polynomial, E4, has a zero. 
And we can prove that this always happens for the expected Euler characteristic polynomials. So here's the theorem. The polynomial ED, giving the expected Euler characteristic for a random cubical complex of dimension D, has D plus 1 roots in the closed interval 0, 1, including the roots at Q equals 0 and Q equals 1. Moreover, the roots of the polynomial E D plus 1 in the open interval interleave the roots of the polynomial E sub D. So, you might wonder, how can we explain this interleaving? Well, the expected Euler characteristic polynomials satisfy a recurrence. E sub D plus 1 of Q is equal to E sub D of Q squared minus E sub D of Q. This is because the expected Euler characteristic polynomials have coefficients that involve the, the binomial coefficient. But look what happens when I take the polynomial E sub D and apply this recurrence. Here's a picture of part of the graph of E sub D of Q, the part that's between two zeros, which I'll call Q sub zero and Q sub one. It's very important that the square root of Q sub zero is less than q sub 1. And keep in mind, since q sub 0 is less than 1, its square root is larger than itself. But as long as the, the square root of q sub 0 is less than q sub 1, when I replace q by q squared in this polynomial, I obtain part of the graph of e sub d of q squared that, well, it looks pretty much like the graph of e sub d, but shifted to the right a little bit. And because the square root of q sub 0 is less than q sub 1, these graphs have an intersection that's between q sub 0 and q sub 1. That intersection turns out to be the 0 of the graph of e sub d plus 1, because e sub d plus 1 is the difference of these two graphs which I first drew, it's the red graph minus the purple graph. That's the graph of the next polynomial, e sub d plus 1, and it has a 0 between the two zeros of the graph of the polynomial e sub d. So e sub d plus 1 has at least one 0 between each two zeros of e sub d. And in fact, because we have formulas for these polynomials, we can prove interleaving by also observing, say by Descartes' rule of signs, that e sub d has at most d positive zeros. A complete proof of this interleaving is in the paper, which I'll mention at the end of the presentation. Now let's consider the variance of the intrinsic volumes of a random cubical complex. I can write the variance of mu k of c as follows, and I can replace mu k of, of c on the right-hand side by the sum of the indicator random variables which we saw earlier. So I'm summing over all open cubes x of all dimensions in the random cubical complex. If I multiply out the terms on the right hand side, I obtain sums over all pairs of open cubes x and y in my random cubical complex, including cases where x and y are actually the same cube. And really I don't need two sums here, I can write it as a single sum. I have a sum over all pairs of open unit cubes x and y of the expected value of xc sub x times xc sub y minus the expected value of xc sub x times the expected value of xc sub y. The question is, when are these two terms the same? Well, if, if xc sub x and xc sub y are independent random variables, then these two expectations are in fact the same. So I really only have to consider the sum over all pairs of cubes such that these random variables are dependent, or call those dependent cubes. Cubes x and y, such that the random variables are dependent. So the question is, for what pairs of cubes x and y are these random variables dependent? Well, let's see. Consider these two open cubes, x and y. Cube y is included exactly when one of these two purple top dimensional cubes are included, whereas cube x is included exactly when one of these two orange top dimensional cubes are included. Since the set of orange cubes is 
disjoint from the set of purple cubes, x and y are independent cubes. They're random variables xc sub x and xc sub y are independent. However, if I consider these pair of cubes, x and y on the right, these cubes are both included in the cubical complex whenever this red cube is included in the complex. So these cubes are dependent. The variables xc sub x and xc sub y are dependent because cubes x and y are faces of a common top-dimensional cube. And in fact, that is the situation in which cubes are dependent. Cubes x and y are dependent exactly when they are faces of some common top-dimensional cube. Thus, I can write the variance of the intrinsic volume mu k of z as a sum over all possible dimensions of cube x, and then another sum over all possible dimensions of cube y. But then what goes inside this double sum is a complicated mess, which would take an entire slide practically to write down. The important thing, however, is that this sum turns out to be n to the d times a polynomial in q of degree 2 to the d minus k. This is very similar to what we saw before for the expected value of the intrinsic volumes, but the polynomial we obtain in this case is much more complicated. Let's let v sub d, d comma k of q be the variance per unit volume of the intrinsic volume mu sub k of c. Then we have a polynomial in q of degree 2 to the d minus k, and this table shows us samples of these polynomials for small d and k. And in fact, we see that these polynomials are much more complicated than the ones we previously obtained for the expected values. However, we see some similar patterns. First of all, if we look along the diagonal of this table where d equals k, we see that we always get the polynomial q minus q squared. This diagonal, as we said previously, is the diagonal where the co-dimension is zero, and we always get the same polynomial. Along the next diagonal, where d is one more than k, that is where the co-dimension is one, we always get polynomials of degree four, and while they're not multiples of each other, they have sort of similar shapes. We'll look at a graph of these in just a moment. Along the next diagonal, we have polynomials of degree 8, and then polynomials of degree 16, and so on. One interesting thing in this table is that for all the polynomials displayed, the coefficients of q up to q to the 2 to the d minus k are all non-zero, except for the coefficient of q to the 13 in this polynomial here that's highlighted in red. For some reason, the coefficient of q to the 13 is zero in that table, and it's the only zero coefficient I found in my exploration of these polynomials. I'm not sure why that is. So let's take a look at the graph of the polynomials in codimension one, where d minus k equals one. If I graph the first polynomial, so this polynomial gives the variance of the Euler characteristic for one-dimensional cubical complex. This is what it looks like. The next polynomial gives the variance of the mu1 intrinsic volume for a two-dimensional cubical complex. And here is its graph in green. And then the variance of mu2 for a three-dimensional cubical complex in orange. And so on, the variance of mu3 for a four-dimensional cubical complex in red. And these polynomials are not multiples of each other, but you really have to look closely to see that. Their graphs look like they almost could be multiples of each other, but they're not. And in fact, the x-coordinates of the local maxima are not directly on top of each other. They gradually spread out as you graph more and more of this family of polynomials. We can find similar patterns when we look at the variance polynomials for the graphs of other fixed codimensions. At this point, I'm not quite sure what to make of these patterns, but we can observe them nonetheless. At this point, we have expected values and variances of the intrinsic volumes of the random cubical complex. And the next question one might ask is, do we have a central limit theorem? What can we say about the distribution of the intrinsic volumes as the size of the complex goes to infinity? The central limit theorem in this case is a manifestation of the idea, which is common in probability, 
that a sum of many random variables that are mostly independent has a distribution that is close to normal. In this case, the intrinsic volume mu k of c is a sum of many random variables. It's a sum of all these indicator random variables, x c sub x, for all of the open cubes of all dimensions in our grid. Are these random variables mostly independent? Well, yes. If I pick any open cube, x, I've drawn here a zero-dimensional cube, but it could be a cube of any dimension. The only cubes that are dependent with x are cubes that are faces of these d cubes that are neighbors of x, which x is a face. How many such cubes are there that are dependent with x? Well, x is a face of at most 2 to the d d cubes. If x is a point, then it's a face of exactly 2 to the d d cubes. Each of these unit d cubes has 3 to the d total faces. That's the number of faces of all dimensions of a particular uh, d-dimensional cube. Therefore, the size of the dependence neighborhood of x, that is, the size of the set of all of the indicator random variables that are dependent with x c sub x, the size of this dependence neighborhood cannot be greater than 2 to the d times 3 to the d, or that is, 6 to the d. This is an upper bound. We could, of course, do better. We've overcounted some cubes. But the important thing is that this bound is independent of n, n being, as before, the size of the grid. Therefore, we can use this idea to obtain a central limit theorem. I will explain briefly this process of proving the central limit theorem using something called Stein's method. Most of the work is done by a theorem about sums of mostly independent random variables in a survey of Stein's method by Nathan Ross. Let's let sigma squared be the variance of the intrinsic volume mu k of c. We found this before. Now let's let w be the random variable that's defined as taking the sum over all open cubes x of all dimensions in our grid, normalizing, so taking xc sub x minus its expected value, and dividing by the standard deviation. w is also equal to the intrinsic volume mu k of c minus its expected value divided by the standard deviation. What we want to see is that the random variable w converges to a standard normal random variable as n goes to infinity. And in fact, this happens. So let z be a standard normal random variable. Now the following inequality is by Stein's method. This is a special case of an inequality that appears in a theorem in a paper, a survey of Stein's method, by a mathematician named Nathan Ross. And here I've substituted in the particular variables that we find in our situation. On the left, we have a distance between the random variables w and c. In particular, this is the Wasserstein distance, which is a common distance when studying distributions of random variables. This distance is less than or equal to this following quantity. Let's see what we have here. In this first sum, we're summing over all open cubes of all dimensions in our grid. We're taking the expected value of xc sub x minus its expected value cubed. The important thing here is that the number of cubes in the grid of all dimensions is of order n to the d. So this part of the sum is of order n to the d. The particular values inside of the sum are bounded. We see a similar term here on the right, but this term is under a square root. We have inside the square root something that's of order n to the d. We take its square root, it's of order n to the d divided by 2. Now the variance of the intrinsic volume mu k of c is also of order n to the d. So when the variance appears in the denominator of the fraction, like here indicated in purple, this fraction is of order n to the minus d. And likewise, the fraction that precedes the previous term has the variance raised to the 3 halves power in the denominator. This term is of order n to the minus 3d over 2. When I put all this together and consider the order of the entire right-hand side of the inequality, I see that, that this expression is of order n to the minus d over 2. Therefore, the Wasserstein distance 
between the random variables w and z is of order n to the minus d over 2, which means that this distance converges to 0 as n goes to infinity. And if the Wasserstein distance converges to 0, this implies that the random variables converge in distribution, and we obtain our central limit theorem. As n goes to infinity, the random variable mu k of z converges in distribution to a normal random variable with mean and variance given by the polynomials which we saw earlier. I would like to conclude with a few words about current research and applications. Suppose, instead of simply choosing to include or not include cubes with some probability, that we assign to each d cube a number from some distribution. I can visualize this by, instead of coloring pixels black and white, coloring them in shades of gray, where the grayscale values represent numbers selected from some distribution. We might call the resulting object a discrete random field, because it's somehow a discrete version of the perhaps Gaussian random fields studied by various mathematicians, including Robert Adler and Jonathan Taylor. Of course, we could also call this object a random image, because that's also sort of what it is. Viewing this object as a random field, or perhaps as a function on some domain, we might ask the question, what is its expected Euler integral? Or what is its expected Hodwiger integral? We can think of the Euler integral and the Hodwiger integral as more general versions of Euler characteristic and intrinsic volume that apply in the setting of functions rather than sets. Why would we care about such a thing? Well, one application is image processing. For example, the local Euler integral seems to be useful for texture analysis. This is something that Michael Robinson at American University has observed. He has taken a small box and for each position of the box in the digital image computed the local Euler integral of the image inside the box. And he has observed that this seems to be able to distinguish between textures in the digital image. We're currently talking about how to apply this knowledge of random cubicle complexes to his work in order to provide a more rigorous foundation for his observations. Finally, I'd like to leave you with a reference for a paper in which you can read about everything in this presentation and more. This is a recent paper by myself and Michael Werman titled Intrinsic Volumes of Random Cubicle Complexes, which you can find now on the archive, and there's a link below. Once again, my name is Matthew Wright. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications at the University of Minnesota, and thank you for viewing this presentation.